Assalamu uh, alaikum, everybody. Uh, I welcome you to this uh, event titled Advanced and Practical Features of uh, Great Scope. This is the second topic that discusses Great Scope. The, first, um, the second event that uh, discusses uh, Great Scope, the first one was on Sunday, given by Dr. Wasf al Khatib. Uh, there will be a little bit of overlap between what I say in this uh, webinar and what Dr. Wasfi did. So uh, don't worry if you attended the first one, you're not going to feel bored in here. And if you didn't attend the first one, uh, I'll talk about many of the things that kind of Dr. Wasfi talked about uh, broadly. And I tried my best to make this uh, PowerPoint presentation as short as possible. There are only about 10 slides or so because I'd like to show you uh, how you can use great scope. So after the PowerPoint presentation, what I'll do is I'll go through, uh, I'll go to great scope and I will uh, uh, show you some of the things that you will have to do if you're gonna be using great scope. Uh, so the outline is not that long, I'll not go over it, but uh, let's start by talking what, about what great scope is. And honestly, in, in the past three or four days since we announced those events, uh, many faculty, have, I saw several faculty uh, in different places ask me, what is great scope? Does it grade for you? And uh, well, great scope basically is a grading system. It helps you grade, it does not grade for you. I mean, it can do a little bit of grading here and there, but the main purpose of great scope is not that you just give it the exam and it will do all of the grading for you. This is, nothing can do this. So basically great scope is a browser-based online grading system. Think of it as an assistant who's sitting beside you, and that assistant is handing you the exam sheets. By the way, Gradescope is designed for grading paper-based uh, assessments, although it can grade other types of assessments that are not paper-based, but uh, the, the main purpose of it is to grade paper-based assessments. So an assistant sitting beside you, that assistant is handing you the exam sheets, opening for you the, the exam on the uh, appropriate, let's say, or, uh, on the specific, a uh, problem that you want to grade and so on, taking the exam sheets from you, adding the marks and so on. This, all of this is done by Gradescope. And this is why Gradescope helps you in grading, but it does not do the grading for you generally. Okay? Uh, I've, uh, several uh, people have asked me, does it do electronic assessment? Well, there's a small feature in it that allows it to do electronic assessment, kind of an, an, you know, an, an electronic exam system, similar to what Blackboard can do. But that's kind of a side uh, task and it, it, its features are quite simple. Well, maybe I'll talk about it at the end if there is time. Okay. As I mentioned, it can auto grade specific types of questions, but mostly you as an instructor will be doing the, the grading. Okay. So it streams line the grading process uh, a lot. Okay. Uh, some of the features or let's say some of the things that I noticed about grade scope is that it makes grading significantly more fun. And I'm one of those who, can hardly grade, let's say, uh, an exam in three or four settings. Uh, usually it takes me two to three days. I found that when I uh, started using Gradescope, grading was a little bit more fun and I was able to grade for longer periods of time. It reduces the possibility of errors because it adds numbers and so on. So you do not have to worry about that. And, and one of the important things that it also helps you is that it makes the exam fair to, to different students in the same section as well as uh, across different sections of coordinated courses. So, so it has some good features. In fact, uh, I kind of brainstormed and I looked here and there and found uh, kind of a list of some of the benefits that you'll gain if you use great scope. Um, I'm not gonna go over all of them, okay? but uh, maybe some of the, the highlights is that it will it provides students with quick and very consistent feedback. So basically the student theoretically, if you use Gradescope properly, will be able to know where he made the mistakes, uh, he or she made the mistakes. And, uh, and so, so it's significantly better feedback than typically what we as faculty members provide to students on uh, paper uh, exams. Uh, one of the features also is that instead of, if you like, for example, to grade uh, in different places, it will help you doing that because you do not have to carry the exam sheets. Uh, it, it has a very intuitive uh, and easy to use grading functionality. In fact, this is one of the nicest features I think of it. Once I learned this in the summer, uh, whenever a student asked me, for example, telling me that uh, you, there's this, may, may, maybe you didn't grade this point uh, for me correctly, 
I would ask the student, please go on Gradescope and send me a request through Gradescope. And Gradescope makes the process significantly easier and significantly easier for the student as well as you to respond to uh, regrade requests from students. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of uh, other features. Uh, it also helps, uh, one of the important features of it is that it allows synchronous and, and asynchronous collaborative grading. So if you and three or four other faculty members are grading the same exam, the same coordinated uh, exam, this makes it extremely simple to do that and many other features. Now there, I'm not saying that everything in Gradescope is great and there are no drawbacks, let's say, or challenges in using Gradescope. Clearly, Gradescope is uh, an online grading system, which means that you need to have a fast and very reliable internet service, uh, internet uh, connection. If you don't have internet, you cannot grade. In the past, I used to grade using OneNote. So I would scan my uh, exam sheets, put them on OneNote, and I can take my computer wherever without an internet connection and do the grading. With Gradescope, you cannot do this. For you to grade on Gradescope, you must have an active and fast internet connection. If you're using a slow internet connection, it's gonna be a nightmare. It also, I think having a computer with a stylus, with a pen, makes it significantly better. It's not a must, but it, it is one of the recommended things. And clearly you have to scan your exam sheets. There's uh, no uh, going around this this point. So th those are maybe the, the kind of drawbacks or challenges that you'll have to uh, think about if you're using Gradescope. Now, um, I mentioned that Gradescope helps in, in grading. Uh, you can use Gradescope in one form of Gradescope. You can use it just like you're grading on paper, meaning that it will provide you with exam sheets one by one. And in this situation, you can grade them just like you're grading on paper. But there are features of Gradescope that allows it to group answers together in a specific way. Meaning if, for example, you're giving uh, students uh, multiple choice, uh, let's say question, in which you're asking them to put the uh, answer or the, the letter of the correct answer in a box, Gradescope will look at that box that you specified to it and will group them into those are the students that, who have selected A. Those are the students who have selected uh, option B. Those are the students who selected option C and so on. And if it does this by giving one of the students who selected, for example, answer A, if answer A is the correct answer, by telling the grace code that answer A is the correct answer, it will go and give all of the students who have selected the same answer, will give them exactly the same mark. If, for example, answer B is wrong, but let's say you want to give partial credit for that answer, then by selecting for one of the students telling uh, Gradescope that uh, answer B, please give that student uh, partial credit, for example, of one half, it will go and assign one half to all of the students who have selected this. By selecting that answer D, for example, is incorrect, so zero points, all of the students who have selected uh, answer D will get zero. So it kind of, uh, because it has the an AI capability where it can group different answers together as groups, it sometimes makes grading significantly faster and significantly more fun. So this is kind of the an, an advanced, let's say, an, an added feature of Gradescope that makes it uh, sometimes increase the speed of grading uh, significantly. And by the way, it can group answers based on one of different groupings. For example, you can ask it to, whenever it sees a uh, blank answer, okay, group all of the answers that are blank into one group where, for example, you give them zero. Okay? And all of the non-blank answers, you'll have to grade them one by one. Okay? Or if you have MCQ questions, it can, as I mentioned, it can group uh, similar MCQ choices or answers together. Uh, it can also group uh, based on mathematical final answers. For example, if you if the answer is x squared plus three, it will look at the answers regardless of the handwriting, and it will try to figure out that oh, all of those students have written x squared plus three. So it will group them into one group. If there was another group that selected x squared plus seven, for example, it will group them into another group and so on. So it can also understand mathematical uh, formula. And it can also group uh, text-based answers, uh, kind of if the answer is a single word or maybe a small phrase or, or a short phrase. It can also group uh, answers based on short answers, but don't expect it to group to you answers that are complicated, a multi-line answer or so. Uh, it cannot do that. It, it doesn't have the, this capability. 
Now, uh, clearly, if you're going to be uh, using Grayscope, you'll have to scan uh, assessments. I remember the first time I scanned or I, I used a scanner to scan uh, exam sheets. It took me, honestly, about three hours to scan. I was using my home scanner at the time, and it was a nightmare. So I figured that this was clearly not the way to go. So after that, I thought, why don't I use one of the scanners, one of the photocom machines that exist at KPPM, and I have a photocom machine that is just opposite to my office. So I came and tested it, and it was just perfect. Okay? So what I did is I created a short video. If you allow me, let me just play that video, which will kind of give you a hint of what you need to do if you're going to be using one of those uh, scanners. And I hope that the video will, will, uh, the, will appear to you clearly, as well as the sound. It's about a four or five minute uh, video. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In this video, I'll show you how you can use one of those standard uh, photocopy machines that exist in, in many departments at KPPM. The uh, machine that I'm using is uh, called the Toshiba E-Studio 655, which I figured out that it, it's available in many other departments. So what I'll do is I'll turn it on. I'll just log in to the device. And because I want to do scanning, so I'll, I'll, I'll scan all of the sheets into a USB device. Uh, I'll, I'll just plug in a U standard USB device into the input of that. Yeah, and select scan there. So, okay. so I've just selected scan. I'll select the option which is file slash USB. A uh, few seconds after you plug in the uh, USB device, you'll see that one of the options there will be uh, available which is USB media so I'll select this because I want to store all of the files into the USB and Grayscope only accepts PDF files so I'll select PDF uh, I'll leave the multi slash single uh, on multi because I want to scan multiple sheets okay. uh, and there are other options that you can select which uh, include the resolution I found that 300 or 400 usually I use 400 but 300 or 400 dots per inch are uh, will provide you with good resolution and I would suggest that you use grayscale yeah? now depending on the size of papers it's either going to be uh, an A4 or maybe the, the size that is slightly larger which is provided by the uh, photocopy center in building 21 so uh, depending on this if you're going to be using A4 you're probably going to put the sheets this way if you're going to be using the uh, bigger uh, sheets you're going to you, you will have to put the sheets this way because the photocopy machines here can only accommodate something like A4 or maybe slightly larger. So depending on this, you'll either select a book, uh, assuming that you want to scan both sides. If you're going to be scanning only, uh, or your scans are going to be single-sided, then leave it on single. If you want to scan both sides of the sheets, you'll have either to use book or use tablet uh, form. Book is if you're going to be putting the sheets this way, and tablet if you're going to be putting it the uh, in kind of an, in a portrait uh, uh, orientation. Okay? So since my size in here is going to be uh, uh, A4, I'm going to put the sheets this way. Okay? So I'll select the book uh, kind of binding uh, format. And one of some some of the other uh, options include the rotation. If you're going to be putting the sheets this way, then you shouldn't have any rotation, meaning that the the, the sheets are put this way and the scans appear this way. If you're going to be putting the sheets this way and you want the scans to be uh, this way, then you have to select the other option here, which basically rotates something like 90 degrees uh, clockwise. So because I'm going to be putting the sheets this way, I'll, I'll select the first option. Uh, I'll leave the compression on, on high. It, it doesn't make that much difference. And if you feel that the student scan, uh, the student writing may not be uh, very clear, you probably can increase this exposure a little bit. Yeah? So this basically sets uh, all everything that I want in here. Let me just make sure. Okay. Yeah, so all of the settings here have been set properly. And now what I'll do is I'll show you exactly how you can scan. And I'll, I'll do it very quickly. So what you'll have to do is just remove the staples. You can either remove it using your nail or using uh, one of those uh, stable remover, removers. So I'll just put it there and I'll scan. And you see it doing the, the scanning both sides. And please make sure that when you're scanning, the count that of pages that will provide you uh, corresponds to the number of pages of the exam. Because sometimes it may pull two sheets together, so your only indication is going to be on appearing on the number of scans in here. And I have nine sheets, which means 18, and if, if you notice that the last number that appeared there was 18. 
So now I've scanned the first sheet, and as, as you notice, it took maybe 10, 15 seconds. I'll just staple it. And I'll go to the next sheet. Remove the stable. Plug it in there. Scan. And again, I'm, I'm expecting a, a maximum value there that is equal to 18. Although my exam, by the way, was uh, single-sided, and I asked the students only to write on one side, but in case you have an exam that is double-sided, so this, this should be the situation. So I've scanned the second one. Let me just scan one more third, one third exam sheet, just to show you that you can probably do the scanning very, very quickly and very efficiently using those devices. So this is the third sheet. And by the way, notice that I am removing the stable, scanning, and then stabling. The whole thing takes approximately 30 seconds per, uh, per exam booklet. Uh, given that I have uh, an exam booklet that, that contains nine sheets, and I'm scanning 18 uh, pages. So as you see, I scanned three sheets now in approximately a minute, maybe, or a minute and a half, uh, which is quite efficient and very, very, very practical. Okay, so this is the video. By the way, uh, please accept my apologies for the uh, quality of the video. We just did it, you know, uh, quickly, my, myself and my secretary, Arshad, uh, yesterday in here in the uh, Deanship of Academic Development. So we, I didn't do any editing to it. So this is basically how you can scan it, as you see. Uh, typically, if no problems, let's say, occur and during the scanning, I can scan a 30 sheet exam in about 15, 20 minutes at most. Uh, if you have bigger sections and you collaborate with other people and doing the scanning, the, the scanning shouldn't take that, that long. It shouldn't be at least an issue. Uh, you know, scanning does, does not become a major component of the grading uh, process. Now, uh, let me just go over the workflow of Gradescope. And if you allow me, let me just go to another app in which I created kind of a flow chart that shows you basically how things go if you're using uh, Gradescope. So basically, this is what you'll have to do. If you have never used Gradescope, at the beginning, you'll have to create an account. And the account has to be with your KPPM username. Otherwise, it's going to be a trial uh, account and you're not gonna have all of the features. KPPM uh, got an, an institutional uh, license, which basically provides all of the, uh, all of the, let's say, functionality of Gradescope, including uh, the integration with Blackboard, although it's not done yet, but inshallah, it's in the, in the process. So you'd have to, cre to create an account first, and then you'll uh, just, uh, okay. So you'll have to create, my, my computer's causing a problem here. So the screen is broken, and sometimes it feels that I'm touching it somewhere. Okay. My apologies for that. Okay, so you'll have to, to log in to Gradescope. And then once you log in, you can create a course. If you have three courses, create three courses. Okay? Uh, after you create a course, you'll have to add students. And I'll show you this practically in, in a few minutes. You'll have to add the uh, students to each course. Hopefully, once the integration is complete uh, with the Blackboard, the students will be imported from Blackboard or, or, or from Banner. So you'll not have to do this. But at least for the time being, you'll have to add students. And adding students is quite an easy process. And then you'll have to create an assessment. Let's say you want to create, for example, an assessment. The assessment can be one of five types that uh, Gradescope uh, supports. One of them is called programming assignment. I'm not going to talk about this. In fact, I've never used this, so I, I don't know much about it. But I know that Gradescope can grade programming, uh, let's say, codes that stu your students uh, provide. It can do the grading for those. Um, but I, I'm not going to talk about it, as I mentioned. Now, the other options are either homework or something that's similar to homework, or it can be an exam or quiz, which is which has different, let's say, features or different uh, uh, process. And then it can also be another type of exams, which is bubble sheet, basically MCQ, or it can be an online assessment. I'll try to talk about all of those. The last option, which is the online assessment, is still in the beta testing. Even if you log in there, it will tell you that it's beta. So it's still apparently that they haven't finalized the, the system. It, it works but they may do some adjustments to it before it's uh, finally deployed. Okay? Let me go to those kind of one by one. Very quickly, I'll just tell you what, what you'll have to do. Let's say that you want to uh, create an assignment, which is a homework. Okay? Now, the default case, or let's say the default options for the homework is that the scans are uploaded by the students. In Gradescope, you can either do the scans yourself, 
or you can ask your students to, uh, to upload. Dr. Wasfi mentioned that even in exams, he let the students uh, do the, uh, the scanning. I personally did not do it. And I, I, I don't know, I, maybe I had some reservation regarding that because I always felt that uh, I don't want the students to have access to the final, let's say, work because th there could be things that happen which you uh, don't want. I, um, some students could cheat, some students could could uh, send files to other students and so on. So, so I, I prefer that I, I personally like uh, for exams that I do the scanning for the homeworks, I let the students do, do the scanning. So for homework assignments, the scans are uploaded, are done and uploaded by the students. And the uh, format of the assignment is what they call variable length assessment, meaning that a student could submit three pages and another student could submit seven pages. Okay, So you do not specify the number of pages and there is no template for that assessment. So if this is your option, what you'll have to do is you'll have to insert the assessment name, homework four, for example, and then insert a template. For this format, even the templates that you insert could just be a blank PDF file. So, so the template is not necessary. The template is necessary with the other form, but not with this form. And then you'd have to select a release date and a due date for that assi assignment. So for example, you release it today and the due date is after three days. So after that, those three days, no students will be able to submit their homework uh, solution. Okay? And then you'd have to insert in Gradescope the questions, for example, you say, you tell Grace Cope that there are five questions, question one, two, three, four, and five. Question one is worth 10 points, question two is worth 20 points, and so on. Okay? Because this will help you or the grader later to assign marks to the different questions. Now the students will do the scans and will solve the, will solve the homework and do the scans and submit through Grade Scope. So you'll have to wait until the deadline. Now, after the deadline, you can create the rubric for the uh, assignment or your grader. Uh, by the way, you can easily add graders into uh, grade scope who take care, for example, of grading homeworks. So you or the, grade, the grader will create the rubric, then you start grading. Once grading is uh, completed, you can review the grades, publish the grades to students, send them an email informing them that the, the grades have been, uh, or, or let's say the homework assignment has been graded. And those are the statistics of the, uh, of the grades and then, you, all you have to do is just wait for to respond to grade requests. So this is in the case that you uh, are creating an assignment, which is basically a homework assignment. Now, if you're creating a quiz or an exam, the flow is a little bit different. You'll insert an assessment name, insert the template. And in this situation, the template is extremely important. And usually the template has to be, uh, this is what I used to do. So I printed, for example, 30 copies of the exam for my students. I'll print 31 uh, and one additional copy and i'll scan that additional copy uh, after the students uh, do the the exam and this becomes the template because it's important that the template basically is exactly a copy of the uh, one copy of the e exam sheet and i don't recommend that you generate a pdf file from from your uh, exam because the orientation of different items in it might be slightly different so print the exam and photocopy or scan one copy of it and make this become the template. And then you select the name, uh, just give me a minute, okay? So uh, after you insert the template, what you'll have to do is, uh, in the template, you'll have to select the, my apologies, the, the computer here is, okay. So you'll have to select the name and the ID regions in the template that correspond to the student names and IDs. My apologies. Uh, I think I'll, I'll just use the mouse. Even the mouse doesn't. Uh, as you notice in here, my, my apologies. This computer is, has a cracked screen and it keeps thinking that I'm touching the screen at a specific location. Maybe I should have used another. Uh, so look. Okay, hopefully. Okay. So uh, you'd have to insert in your template, you'll have to indicate to, to grade scope where is the location of the name and the ID. Remember that in the case of the homework, the students themselves are uploading the assignment. So grade scope does not confuse the sheets or let's say the, the, the submissions of student A with student B. But in this situation, you are the one who's going to be doing the scanning. So you have to give grade scope the location of the name and the ID. Uh, in the template so that it can check all of the scans and determine where 
which student submitted which, so that it can it can basically assign this uh, scan to student A, this scan to student B, and so on. So this is uh, necessary in the case of an assign uh, an assignment which is either a quiz or uh, an uh, an exam. And then Grace Cope will try to figure out the uh, different uh, students' names and, and let's say try to to link the the submissions of different students with their. Uh, with the class roster that that you'll uh, provide great scope with but it may miss a few names here or there that for example the handwriting of the student was not very clear so you'll have to go and uh, and allocate whatever great scope could not assign you'll have to go and it, it's a very simple process that usually for 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 the remaining 10 or 20 percent of students that great scope could not figure uh, out it usually takes uh, maybe a minute or or, or two to to assign the names uh, for that for those students. After that, you'll have to go to each to the template and specify the the answer or the location in the template uh, that represents the answer for each one of the questions and give to each one of those the weight of that question. Meaning, the question number one is worth ten points. Question number two is worth twenty points, and so on. After that, you'll have to do the scans and then upload the the scans to Grayscope. Grayscope will work on those. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, link the, the sheets of the students with their uh, names. And then the rest becomes just like what you do with the uh, homework. It will, you'll have to create the rubric, grade the exam, review the grades, and then publish the grades and uh, send the emails to students and finally respond to, to their requests. Uh, the uh, third option is if you're going to be giving a fully multiple choice or MCQ uh, exam. The, the flow is a little bit different. Uh, Dr. Wasfi, I remember in his uh, event, he indicated that he's not going to focus on this. And I understand his, his uh, let's say, uh, point that uh, KFPM has an ICTC. They have a center that is responsible for doing this. But uh, in fact, I think that even for MCQ questions, I will suggest that you use Gradescope for a reason that I'll mention in a few minutes. Okay. So if you're going to be using uh, Gradescope to grade uh, MCQ questions and MCQ, and grade scope will fully automatically grade all MCQ uh, exams. So you'll have to download a template that exists on grade scope, and I'll show it to you, inshallah, if there's time. Uh, you can just download it, give it to the students. After the, the students solve, you'll collect those uh, uh, bubble uh, forms from them. And then uh, you will, the, the bubble forms, as I'll show you, inshallah, has uh, kind of locations, or let's say, uh, marks that will allow Gradescope to identify the location of the name as well as the ID and the location of the answer for each one of the questions. And in the case of Gradescope, uh, and if you're going to be using this form, Gradescope allows uh, exams that are up to 200 questions in length. I'm still facing that same issue. Maybe, maybe I should have used another computer for doing this uh, presentation. So, uh, uh, and by the way, if you're going to be using MCQ questions or an MCQ form or the, the, the bubble uh, bubble sheets or so, uh, Gradescope allows for exams that have up to five forms. Okay? So you can have form A, B, C, D, and E, uh, up to five forms. Okay? Uh, you'll have to select in each, for each form, if you have four forms, you'll have to go to each form and specify the correct answers for each one of those uh, questions. And then after the exam, you'll have to scan those bubble uh, sheets, uh, uplink them, to, or let's say uh, upload them to, to Gradescope and link again, if uh, any of the student's name, for example, was not clear, you'll have to identify who's, you, what, what, link the, the sheets that were not identified to the, to the student's uh, names. And then uh, Gradescope will do the grading completely automatically. You'll have to just review the grades, publish them and uh, respond again to, uh, request from students. So this is basically kind of the flow of using Gradescope. Th those are the main things that you'll have to do if you're going to be using Gradescope, regardless of the assignment type. And as I mentioned, there's uh, the 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 last type, which is online assignment. And in this situation, in this situation, what you'll have to do is just create the exam, kind of an, an assignment uh, online in on Gradescope. Uh, the assignment will be available to students. Students will log into Gradescope, see the assignment there, go into it do the uh, uh, solve the assignment online and then grace couple take care of everything uh, automatically you do not have to do much uh, in that form of uh, assessment so let me just close this 
now I'll go back to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So uh, one of the nice features, I think, of uh, grade scope is that it tries to simplify the process of grading. How does it do this? Now, uh, you know that in Windows, for example, or in many applications, there are a lot of shortcuts that allow you, for example, to, to do simple tasks easily. For example, if you want to copy and paste, one of the things that you can do is you can go to edit, copy, and, uh, and, and so on, or edit, paste. But you can always use Control-C and Control-V, for example. So Gradescope also has a lot of shortcuts that help you in grading at a much faster speed. If you know those shortcuts and you get used to them, you can grade at a much, much faster speed. For example, the numbers 1, 2, up to 0, uh, 1, 2, 3, uh, up to 9, and then followed by 0, you can use those for selecting the rubric items. You'll see that whenever you create uh, a rubric for a specific question in Gradescope, each item in the rubric will have a number that comes in front of it. You can either using your mouse click on that number to indicate that that student, for example, you want to give him a full mark. So uh, select number one, or you can just click on number one, that item will be selected in the rubric. And then you can also create subgroups for different rubric items. In the subgroup uh, rubric items, you can select the different items using the uh, top level of the uh, of, of the keyboard uh, characters from Q, W, E, R, to the, the QWERTY, basically uh, sequence. You can use all of those to select the uh, items that exist in subgroups uh, for, the, for the rubric. Okay. Uh, one of the things that you can also do is uh, imagine that you have an assistant who's helping you in grading. That assistant is not going to give you a sheet that is already graded. Okay. So you're going to ask that assistant to give you only uh, sheets that are not graded. So by clicking on letter Z, uh, grade scope will take you to the next ungraded uh, assignment. It, even if you grade, for example, randomly, grade number one, grade number seven, followed by 12, and then you go to the beginning, grade scope, if you click on Z, it will avoid the ones that are already graded for you. Okay. Uh, letter F and letter G allow you to zoom out and zoom in, uh, as well as you can use the, the uh, wheel on the mouse to zoom in and zoom out, and you can also use your fingers if you have a touch screen, because you, you can use your fingers to zoom in and zoom out. So there are different options for zooming in and zooming out if you wanted to get, for example, a bigger picture of the, what, what the student did in other parts of the question or so. Okay. Letter J and letter K allow you to go to the previous page of the student and the next page of, for that student. So if you have a multiple uh, page exam, five page or so, it will allow you, for example, to go to the previous pages by clicking on J or to the next page by uh, clicking on letter K. Uh, Gradescope supports two types of grading. It supports what they call horizontal grading, meaning you grade, for example, problem number three for student one, and then problem number three for student two, problem number three for student three, and so on. This is called horizontal. Or you can also grade vertical, meaning problem number one for student one, then problem number two for student one, then problem number three for student one. This is kind of vertical. Uh, so if you want to move between uh, problems for the same student, you can use the comma and the dot. The comma takes you to, to the previous problem and the dot takes you to the next problem. Now, why is this important? If you're grading, for example, uh, a question that contains multiple parts, part A, B, C, and D, and they are dependent on each other, I would generally recommend that you grade vertically, at least for that problem. And then once you're done with all of the uh, parts for that problem for that student, you go to the next problem for, you go to the same problem for the next student and then complete all of the parts and go to the next problem, to the same problem for the following student and so on. So to, to move between the, the different parts of that problem, you'll have to use the comma and the dot. Uh, and one, uh, two more uh, buttons there, which are the arrows on, on the keyboard, okay? This will allow you to move between different submissions, whether they are graded or ungraded. So the difference between Z and the, the uh, let's say, right arrow is that the right arrow will take you to different submissions regardless of whether they are submitted or whether they are graded or not. But the Z will avoid all of the uh, uh, questions that are, or all of the uh, submissions that are graded for that problem, it will avoid them. So this kind of, if you learn how to use this, it will speed up the process of grading massively. Now what I have is, I have some like 12 tips that are uh, very, I think I collected those tips from my experience during the summer. By the way, I'm not an expert in using Gradescope. I just learned how to use Gradescope through the uh, 
by by using it on two courses in the summer. So please accept my apologies. If you ask me a question, I, I cannot answer. But those are kind of the best tips that I can provide you from my experience during the summer. Okay? If you're going to be grading alone, uh, you only you, I would recommend that you develop the rubric as you go, because you'll always do adjustments. If you're going to be grading as a group, you and three other people who are going to be grading, let's say, the same exam, I would recommend that you work as hard as possible to develop the rubric in advance, because it's going to be very difficult for, for you to, to if, if you change the rubric, you can't change it later, but then you have to communicate this to all of the other people who are grading, because they might find that uh, the, the item that you have just added or deleted will affect other students. So they'll have to, you, you'll have to kind of reach an agreement among uh, all of you. So this is why it's also, it's always important that you try your best to uh, develop the rubric for uh, group uh, grading in advance before, before you start the grading as much as possible. Okay. Now, you may think that, uh, let me just develop a rubric with the minimum number of items. No, I, I'm telling you in here in point number two that I would recommend that you have more items in the rubric than you need rather than having less items than you need. If you have an item in the rubric that you never need, no worry, just leave it there. No, it, it has not been used and you can even suppress it. Even the, the students, when they look at their results, you can instruct the grade scope to even eliminate this, not show it to the students. Okay? But the problem is that if you have items that are uh, let's say in the, the, your rubric contains items that are less than what you need. If you add an item later, you might need to regrade some of the sheets. You might find that some of the sheets that uh, th that you have already graded, uh, you need now to revisit them again because maybe the new item that you have just added applies to them. Okay. So I, I would suggest that you put as many items in your rubric, uh, even if you don't use all of those, that's fine, but not less. Uh, one of the things that I discovered, uh, unfortunately, the, the hard way in the first exam in the summer is I gave plenty of space in the exam and students started writing on the back of the sheets. They started writing in different places, even on the back of the cover sheet. And then I, my job was to just try to search for their answers in Gradescope. It's always recommended if you're going to be using Gradescope to, uh, this suggestion was also given by uh, Dr. Wasfi, to use double-sided printing so that you minimize the amount of space that is available to students to just write their, their uh, answers, okay? Uh, another option is if you're gonna be printing on a single-sided, uh, let's say print, print your exam single-sided, uh, and you want only to print the, the front page, tell the students that anything that you're, they write on the back is not gonna be graded. And I, I use this strategy, for example, in the final exams uh, in the summer. So I told the students, only write on the front, whatever you write on the back is for your own, uh, use, I would not grade it. Uh, when uh, grading multi-part questions, as I mentioned, I would recommend that you go vertically okay, rather than horizontally, especially if the, the questions or if the parts depend on each other. If they don't depend on each other, it's okay. You can grade horizontally. Now, if you're gonna be using grade scope, uh, I would recommend that you get into the habit of formatting your exam so that you maybe put a box for students to solve or to write their exam, their, their solution in, so that the students understand that this is only the part, or this is only the box that you will look at. So anything that they write in other places or so, uh, you're not going to grade it. So I would always recommend that you put a box for students to, as I mentioned, to to solve uh, in. And if if the if you're going to be giving a question which is multi part uh, multi part question, I would recommend that you don't write the question in a way where you have part A, B, C, D, and so on. And then you ask the students to solve under those parts. I would recommend that you put part A, give a box under it, part B, give a box under it, part C, give a box under it, and so on. Because this will make your life significantly easier when you're grading using grade scope. Okay. Uh, number six is grade scope supports exporting results. Unfortunately, it does not support importing results, let's say importing marks. So you might find, for example, that you have an assessment that was conducted or that was done, that, that was graded outside grade score. For example, if you have attendance marks. Now, how can you import the marks for attendance into grade score? Because at the end, I would, I would think that most of us want to have all of our grades in one system. 
So how can you import grades that were developed outside Gradescope? An idea came to me in the summer. Why don't I create kind of a dummy uh, assessment, call it attendance, where I created a, a blank PDF file. I, I copied this PDF file. I created something like 30 or whatever the number of students that I had, just created copies of it, and then upload it to Gradescope just like it's, a, it's an assessment. And then Gradescope created for me uh, that blank assessment. And then I went to the rubric and look, looked at all of the marks that exist in the assessment. For example, if it was attendance and I was giving attendance marks that were either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, I would go to the rubric and create five items or six items, one item with mark 0, one item with mark 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Yeah? And then for each one of those students, uh, after I uploaded the uh, blank sheets, I would select one of the blank sheets for student A, one of the blank sheets for student B, and so on. And then went and did uh, acted as if I'm grading for each one of those students. So for student A, I would look at his mark in my attendance sheet. He scored three. I would go and give him three by selecting the rubric item that has three points. So by doing this, all of my marks, including attendance, including participation, or whatever other... Uh, you know, assessments that you did that were not in grade scope, all of those were collected in one uh, platform, which was grade scope, which made it significantly easier for me at the end to look at the bigger picture of all of the grades of students. Uh, I'll skip this point. So the PowerPoint uh, presentation, by the way, I'll make it available if you want. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'm not gonna go into this. Uh, point seven, there are a few more uh, points there. Uh, for MCQ questions, gentlemen, I recommend that you grade, you use grade score for grading it uh, for, for that reason, which is if you use, for example, the services of ICTC to, uh, to grade for you uh, MCQ questions, you'll end up with marks that are on a different platform or let's say on, on an Excel sheet. I would recommend that you use grade scope so that all of your marks for every student uh, become, uh, or, or say become available through grade scope. So by doing this, you will have all of your marks on one platform. This is why I, I was recommending the use of the MCQ or that, that bubble sheet option in Gradescope for doing the, the grading of MCQ questions rather than depend on the services of uh, ICTC. Uh, I'll, I'll also skip this point. Uh, it's not that important. Now, if your exam contains true or false or MCQ questions or final uh, answers, I would recommend that you create a box for students to put the final answer, rather than uh, just leaving the students to, to for example, mark uh, the letter of the of the answer or put true or false wherever they want, because the the grade scope will help you massively. As I'll show you, inshallah, in a few minutes, it will help you massively in determining what the answer or grouping the answers of different students. So unless there is a box, a clear location where the students respond to the uh, answer, it becomes difficult for grade scope to figure out what you want to to uh, group. Uh, it's always important for you as well as your students to do the scanning with as much quality as possible. It saves you a lot of time to put the effort into doing high quality uh, scanning at the beginning, rather than discovering, for example, later that one of the sheets was missing or one of the sheets was not scanned properly. Or for example, the, the handwriting was not very clear and you have to, to scan it again. Although grade scope allows you to change the the existing, let's say, submission of a student with, with another submission, but it's a hassle that you do not want to, to do because it will take much, much more time later if you do it, rather than if you just take the care of making sure that all of your scans are of high quality at the beginning. The last uh, point there is says this, that if you're going to be using grade scope, for example, in future semesters, and you're going to be teaching the same course, I would recommend that always the deadlines, for example, that you give and assessments become in terms of week numbers rather than become uh, in terms of dates. And the reason is grade scope makes it easy for you to copy a course, create another course from that. And it will tell, tell you, please specify the date of the first, the starting date of the first course and the starting date of the second course. And it will just copy the date so that, it, for example, the deadlines of the assignments become, uh, if the deadline in the first course was, for example, the beginning of week four, it will set the deadline in the second course to be the beginning of week four. If your dates were in terms of dates, let's say 10th of January or 15th of February and so on, uh, you'll find that the dates may not correspond to the dates for the next course. So I would recommend that you generally use 
deadlines that appear as the following end of week five or or Tuesday of week eight or so. By instead of using the actual dates, by doing this, it will save you a lot of time when you copy a course to a newer course. So those are the general tips that I will uh, that, that I've kind of gathered from using Gradescope. So what I will do now is I'll go and log into Gradescope and show you basically some of the things that I've just talked about. So let me log in. Now I already have an account. I use it in summer, so I'll just log in. You, if, if you haven't logged in, you'll have to create an account with your KVPM uh, name. Now, those are the two courses that I taught in the summer. And if, if I show you, if I just click on one of them, it will show you that I had 12 assessments, four quizzes, four homeworks, three exams, two mid, mid major exams and a final exam, as well as attendance. I added it there, so I ended up with 12 assessments. And it indicates to you that all of those are fully graded there. Okay? Uh, now I published them, but un unpublished them at the end of the after the final exam. But if you have published something, it will tell you there. It will show you that the the exam th this assessment has been published. And if you enter, you can even see which students have checked their grades and which students did not check their grades in each uh, assessment. So what I will do now is I'll just go and create a new course. So you can easily create a new course. Let me just minimize this. You can easily create a new course uh, okay. by clicking in here. It will ask you some basic information, such as, for example, what is the course name? So I'll just select it, the course name. It's the description about the course and so on. And which semester is this course given in? So it's, so it's fall 2020. Okay. And then you, 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 can, you can allow students, you have two options for putting students into a course. You can either give grade scope list of students, or you can check in this option, which says allow students to enroll by a course entry code, which will give you a five or six digit course, uh, digit code that you can share with your students. The students, when they log into grade scope, they can just put this code and uh, you know basically enroll into the course. But I don't recommend it because some of the students will put strange names. Some of the students may have even two items or let's say log into the course as two different people and so on. So I don't recommend it. I would recommend that you you uh, yourself uh, in, input or let's say insert the uh, class roster rather than allow students to enroll. I mean, I mean, it's your option, but uh, understand that if you allow students to enroll themselves, this is always uh, a possibility. So, so now once I, uh, I'm sorry, I'll just give it a name for the course or the title and then create and it will create for you the course. And then inside this course, you can just create an assignment. So for example, if you click on create an assignment, it will go give you those five options that I told you, either an exam quiz or homework or bubble sheet or programming assignment or the online assignment. Let's say for example, I want to create an exam quiz. So just click on next, give it a, a name. And then if it's an exam, as I mentioned, you'll have to select a template for that. So I have a template there, which I'm calling it in here, a template. So I'll just input it there. Uh, I'm the one who's gonna be uploading the submissions. So by instructor, you can also allow the students to, to, uh, to upload by selecting student there, where you have now to specify what, what time they'll be allowed to, uh, uh, what, what time this assignment will be available and what is the due date for it. Okay. Uh, but I, I will, let's say, set, set this to be the instructor. Okay. And then you can even specify whether you will create the uh, the uh, rubric before the uh, submissions or uh, after the submissions. I think always leaving this while grading the submissions, uh, I think it, it, it is the, the better option. Okay. So, so now once you click on create assignment, it will take maybe, I don't know, 10 seconds or so. Should create it now, Should create it for you. It's taking longer than I expect. It's supposed to, to accept it, but for some reason. I'm not sure is it slow. Uh, it's still working on it, but uh, I don't know why it's taking longer than expected. Usually it takes about three seconds, five seconds or so. But anyway, uh, until this, this takes place, what I will do is I will show you some of the other things that you can do. What if you don't want to create a, a course from, from scratch? You already have a course, okay? or someone has created a course, and I think they, they can share the course with you or so. 
And you want, uh, by the way, uh, one of the things that you can also do in a course is you can delete the course. Don't worry from accidental deletion of a course. Deleting a course that has any submissions is not possible unless you delete all of the submissions of the course. Yeah. So let's say that this is a course that I want to delete. What I will do is I will go to the course settings and you see because the course is empty there. So if I tell it in there, delete the course, it will delete it for me without an, an, an issue, okay? But let's say that one of the things that you can do is you can, if you, if you have already have a course that you taught in the past and you want to uh, duplicate this course or basically create a copy of it, go to the course settings of that course And at the bottom there, it says duplicate the course. So let me do it this way, because I want to show you some of the, the nice features about grade scope. So I'll duplicate it. What, what, what you'll have to do is you'll have to tell grade scope, when did that course, the, the old course, when did it start? So I, uh, this was in the summer. So I think it started in June 5, I think, or something like that. Okay? And when will the next course, the, the new course, when will it start? Let's say, for example, it will start in 28 uh, August. Now, clearly, the, the dates there will be messed up because I'm copying a uh, course that was in the summer to a, a regular semester course. Yeah? But let's say that those were two semesters that were of the same length. Now, once you click on duplicate, it will ask you to, uh, to just specify the, the new name for the course. So this will be 221. I usually put the, core, the, the semester name or the semester, the term after the course so that I can identify the different uh, semesters easily or the different courses. So, uh, so I think I've uh, duplicated it. Okay. Uh, duplicate. Oh, sorry. Uh, hold on, let, let me do this. I'll just select any any two days. It doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, I, I think I think it already duplicated. It. Let me just check. Yeah, uh, it already duplicated the course. I, this is the this is the second one. If you notice in here, it says. Uh, uh, hold on, let me see which one. Uh, one of them is the old course. One of them is, is the new course. Yeah, this is the new course. As you see, nothing is graded there. All of the assignments have been uh, copied. None of the assignments have been graded. So this is the new course. I can easily change. The, uh, the course name by coming in here and giving it the, the new name, 221, and then update the course. And now I have all of the assignments there uh, ready for me. Let me just show you how you can grade. So now assume that I created a new course and this is a new assignment. Okay. Now, one of the things that after you create an assignment, and specify uh, different uh, aspects of that assignment. One of the things that it will tell you is select PDF files that, that, that you want to upload to that assignment. Let's say this was an assessment and those were the submissions of the different students. And now there are about 25 or 26 students. So I'll just select about and upload them there. And you'll see that once you uh, upload all of those uh, submissions to, to grade scope, it will work on them. Uh, it used to take about three, four minutes for uh, an assignment that uh, has about 25. So now probably it will take maybe half a minute or so. And you'll see that as it's uploading the different files, it will indicate to you that it's opening each file, looking at the submission, trying to find the location of the name because I've already given it from the previous course. I've already indicated to, to grade scope where is the location of the name and the ID. And I'll show you this in, in a minute in the outline. So it's gonna go and check the uh, location of the name and the, and the uh, ID for each one of those students and try to link one more thing, which is I forgot to, to, uh, uh, to, to add students to the course. So, so let, let me just stop it. Uh, I think, uh, let, me, let me go back. Steve, okay. um, it's, it's already uploading the, those. So let me, okay, let me go this. Uh, let me click on the roster there. Okay. As you see, this, the course does not have any students. So let me click on add. And there are two options. You can either insert the students one by one or using a CSV file. And the typical format for the CS, CSV file that you're gonna input is first name, last name. You can put, there's an, also an option where you can put the, the name kind of family name, comma first name, or basically a mixed uh, 
the name, okay? But I got in, used to uh, putting the names as first name and last name. And I have created a CSV file there that contains the names. And this is basically the PDF file that contains all of the names of the students, first name, last name, email, and student ID. I just made sure that the emails there are not correct emails so, because when you create, when you add students to the uh, course, it will give you an option of sending them emails, telling them that they have been enrolled. And those are all students. I don't want to send them emails. So I'm, I'm not, I've just made sure that the IDs are uh, incorrect. Let me just upload this uh, CSV file. And the CSV file is here. Okay. Next. So now it gives me the option of either putting the full name of the students, or I can tell it that my uh, students' names are in the form of first name, last name, email, and student ID. The student ID as Dr. Uh, uh, what we mentioned should be just two zero whatever okay with, without the s so now let's say import so it will add all of those students to the to the list okay so those are the students that i have now i can go to the assignment and i can upload the assignment so let me go to the final exam and do that uploading and i'll show you that uh, look it already it already uh, uploaded three or four of the sheets before i uh, canceled it so let me just cancel those. Uh, hold on, let's see uh, how do I do it. Okay, show details. I will just delete them and start fresh. By the way, when you upload the submissions, if for example, for whatever reason, the sheets of one of the submissions were out of order or so, you can easily reorder them. You can delete some of the pages. If there was, for example, some uh, formula sheet at the end of some of the uh, 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 submissions and no formal sheet at the end of some of the submissions or so, you can easily delete whatever pages you're uh, not interested in. So let me just delete those very quickly. Let me click on delete again and do the, up, the upload again. So delete submission. So let me say manage scans. It will ask me again, okay, let me select PDF files and select a few of those. So now as it's uh, scanning, it will try to recognize the names of the students and I'll, I'll show it to you in a minute. It will, uh, that those students, those are their names from the class roster and link them together. By the way, my internet connection here in the office is a little bit weak because the access point is far away. And I always struggle. I'm not sure what will happen with the previous submissions. So now it's, if you notice in here saying that it's finding split points. It's trying to determine based on the template that I've already uploaded, whether for example, the files that I've submitted contain only one submission or two submissions or three submissions. It's doing all of this automatically. And it does honestly an extraordinary job for, in, in doing this. And when it's in doubt, it will indicate to you that, look, I'm not sure where the split point in this PDF file. You provided me a PDF file that contains 50 pages. And I know that the template, for example, is, 20, is 11 pages. So I couldn't figure out how to split this file. So it will allow you to split it yourself. Yes, I think uh, two more or so. I just want to show you how things uh, go um, in, in the system. Okay, so seven. Okay, so it's done with the, uh, let me just, just go to manage submissions now. And you see, that it will, it will submissions and it will show you the names, or it will link the submissions with the, the names of the students. Now it's assigning automatically assigning students' names, and I can with high confidence tell you that probably it will find all of those seven or eight students. Okay. Look, it determined that this is Faisal uh, Hussein, Hatem, and so on. So it, uh, oh, there there are two that it did not identify. This is Abdul Aziz Shahrani. If you just click there. Okay, you can just write in here, 
الشهراني ام سوري الحميدان سوري الحميدان حميداني اوكي اند دكتور وصفي سجست ذات يو كان يوز ذا اي دي يو كان يوز ذا اي دي اور يو كان يوز ذا نيم اوكي زياد زحام اوكي سو ناو اي لينكد اول اوف ذي سبمشنز تو ذا ستودنتس ناو ام ريدي تو جريد And I just want to, I know that the time is, is over, but I just want to show you some of the powers of uh, Gracecope. There are a lot of things that I want to show you, but unfortunately I ran out, out of time. Now the exam contained, this, this was a kind of a long exam. It contained 20 short questions, 22 qu questions. One of them was true or false, or 23 actually questions. Uh, one true or false question and 22 additional questions. The true or false questions contained 20 parts each, And I already in the template, if I go to the, I'm sorry, in the outline, I can, let, let me show you this. This is the outline of the course. I indicated to, to it uh, in, in, to great scope, where's the location of the name and the ID. And for each one of the true or false, I indicated to it a box that indicates where the students are supposed to fill in their answer. So if a student, for example, filled in the answer true or false after the question, it will not uh, identify that. And clearly the student now is at fault. So those boxes represent the locations at which the students need to give the answers. Now, for most of the questions in here in the final exam, I told the students that I will grade based on the final answer only. But for some of the questions, I went and looked at their solutions. So I selected or asked um, Grace Cope to look at the locations of the different answers, final answers first. And then for questions in which I needed to grade partially, I looked at the location in here by zooming out or zooming in to the solution of the students. Okay? But this, those boxes basically indicate where I told grade scope to search for the final answers. Now, let me go to, to grading and show you basically how, how grade scope works. Just three or four minutes, inshallah, and I'll be done. So now let's say I want to grade. Look, it says in here that the progress is zero in all of the items. I have not done any grading. So let me go to part A of the true or false. Click on it. It will automatically group the items. You remember that there were four submissions. Okay? I'm sorry, eight submissions. It has detected that four of the students have selected T and four of the students has selected F. And it automatically, by the way, created two groups. It gave the name for one of the groups to be T and one of the groups to be F. So now it will ask you to uh, review the groups. If it's in doubt, it will tell you that there was one solution that I couldn't figure out whether it's a T or an F that does not belong. And even for those that it's selected as T or F, it will ask you to confirm. So when you, you click on T, it will show you all of the T answers. If those were numbers, it will show you that student number one, for example, put an answer, which is 2.3. Student number two, put 2.3. Student number three, point, put 5.7 and so on. So it will group based on numbers. So now all of those, those are T's confirmed. All of those are F's. Confirmed. Okay. Now you're ready to grade. So it will now take you to grading. If you try to grade without confirming, it will tell you that some of the answers have not been confirmed by you. You haven't checked to make sure that all of them are correct. Now, I don't remember what whether that was a true or an F. Uh, I mean, the answer, the correct answer, okay? But let's say I created the rubric, by the way, in advance. Okay? But if you didn't create it in advance, there will be only one item there. Okay? So you can just select two, T, uh, I'm sorry, correct for, for that student. And if there was no item, this was not there. Let me just delete it. This is typically how you would see uh, the rubric for any question at the beginning. If you want to add a rubric item, just click in here and say something like incorrect. And tell it that, okay, for the correct answer, do not deduct any points because I'm using in here negative uh, model, meaning that uh, the, the mark of this, the uh, question is one point, and then you deduct from that one point uh, if, if a student did not give the correct answer. So for the incorrect answer, I'll select, uh, I'm sorry, I'll set the points there to be minus one. So now any student who gets the, the, the number one, or if I click on number one on the keyboard, I'll indicate to the uh, gray scope that this student got the correct answer. If I click on number two, I'll indicate to the uh, to gray scope that the student uh, got the incorrect answer. So, and I can either use it using the mouse or I can select them using the mouse or I can select them using one and two on the keyboard. Okay. So now this student, let's say, uh, got the correct answer. So I'll just, uh, 
I clicked on one and say next ungraded. Now Gradescope understand that there were four other or three other students who got the same answer. Okay? So it will it already has uh, graded all of those. If you if you notice in here that it already graded four out of eight. Now for the false, I'll give them number two there. They got the incorrect answer. Next ungraded, and that's it. It finished grading that question. Okay, so it graded all of the eight submissions and so on. Let me go to, if you allow me just in one or two minutes, let me go to one of the questions that had, I think, kind of more complicated, uh, I don't remember which one, but let's say in here. By the way, this was a probability and random variables uh, question. In here, I asked grade scope to group the answers based on, let me show you in here. It can, you can either grade individually, meaning if you have eight submissions, you'll have to grade all of the eight individually, or you can group them. If you notice in here, the answers were either, I, th I think the correct answer was seven over 12, but some students put the seven over 12 as a fraction, 0 0.58 or something like that. Eh? So grade scope is not that smart that will figure out that seven over 12 is equal to 0.58. So it will try to group them based on the same shape. So I told it, I want to group them based on, uh, uh, let's say it's a math, fill in the blank, save. So it figured out that there were some students who uh, got an answer, which is seven over 12. Three of those students got the seven over 12. So I'll just review them. Seven over 12, seven over 12, seven over 12. Okay, confirm. Now, what about the rest? Those were the answers. If you notice that there was someone in here, I don't know if, you can, if I can zoom in there. Let me just zoom in there. One of the questions there wrote, one of the students wrote seven over 12, which is equal to 0 0.583 with that dash to indicate that it's, it's a repetitive, okay? So this clearly belongs to the same group. So I can just take it and drop it there, okay? Another seven over, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I just dropped it there. 0.583 belongs also to the same group, although it has a different format. So I'll put it there. 0.583 is also the same. Point five eight three, which is also, also belongs to the same group. Now this is a different group. Uh, this is a different uh, answer. Now it's only it's alone, but I can easily create another group there where I say, for example, incorrect answer. Okay, so it created one group there, and I can just take this thing and dump it there. All of the incorrect answers are dumped. Okay. Now I'm ready to uh, to grade. Let me just zoom out. So now uh, the 0 0.583, which belongs to the correct answers, I'll give it correct. And it will grade seven out of eight, all belong to that group. This was the incorrect answer, so I'll give him the incorrect. And that's it, I have graded that question. I'm not saying that this works for complicated questions, but at least for questions in which you're asking the students for final answers, this works perfectly. Yeah? And if you notice there, now, and there's another question that is fully graded. That's so all, you can repeat this. It honestly saved me a lot of time to grade this exam. You know, I gave this exam in the past, similar to it, let's say something like 80% or 90% similar exam with maybe some changes in numbers and so on. Last time it took me, I'll say a day and a half to grade. This time it took me, um, I think something like three hours or four hours to grade the whole exam, okay? Now there are other features. I'd love to show you how you can for example, uh, create other types of, uh, uh, maybe if you allow me, I promise you, this is the last thing. One of the things that I also would like to show you is what happens with the bubble sheet. I can create a, a new assignment. Uh, let me say assignments there. Create an assignment. One of the assignments there is the bubble sheet. So I'll just give it a name. It was five. Okay. Create. Okay, so th basically now it will allow you to get the template. The template is, is already available there. Let me just open it for you, just to show you. This is the template where students will write their name, ID, section and date, and will indicate which version, If you, assuming that you have multi-versions, okay? And it's a 200 uh, question uh, template. 
And once you scan them, Great Scope will identify those markers at the corners there and be able to identify the location of each one of the questions. And, and based on your selection for the answer, so let's say, for example, we have, uh, uh, we have, for example, three versions. So you'll tell it there, I want to add another version there. So I have version A, version B, and version C. Now for version A, the correct answers are A, C, B, C, E, and so on. Clearly, you, you must develop the exam before you do this. Okay? And you can also specify how the grading, whether it's what they call exact match, meaning that if a student select an incorrect answer, class equals zero, or if you want to give some partial credit and so on, for questions that can, that have multiple answers that are correct. Okay. Uh, so now, once you do this and save the answers, administer the exam, take the uh, bubble sheets after the students have filled them in, scan them, upload them to Gradescope into that assignment, and Gradescope will take uh, care of doing all of the grading. So, so the, the the work there becomes extremely simple. Okay. So this is basically how the the bubble sheet uh, form works, and the last form, which I'm not going to show you, which, which is basically the, the uh, online exam. It's, it's also simple. You can just create a very simple online exam where you can even specify types of questions such as uh, whether they are multiple choice or fill in the blank one. Uh, I tested it. it. It works great, but it's, it has very simple functionality that is even simpler than what uh, Blackboard, for example, can, uh, can provide. So I'll stop at this point, and my apologies. I took approximately 10 or 11 uh, additional minutes of your time. I hope that you found this event useful. And I hope that you'll find great scope useful and you'll use it. By the way, the uh, university has asked us to evaluate the use of great scope at the end of the year. So unless the university shows that really they like great scope, I don't know, maybe the administration administration will decide not to renew the license. So I hope that many of you will find it to be useful so that the university becomes encouraged to renew the license, inshallah, at the end of uh, this academic year. So uh, thank you for attending and have a good day. Yeah, so there are some questions in the chat if you'd like sure, to just- Sure, yeah, uh, let, let me go. Uh, chat, 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 sure. And my apologies, I didn't give you the floor to, to ask questions. Uh, you know, I knew that I will be very tight in time. Uh, so I thought, let me at least deliver what I can, and then I can answer questions at the end. How to log into Great Scope? KPPM is not listed. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the, yeah, there is a list of uh, universities that you uh, apparently that are uh, in which what they call the single sign on is enabled for those universities. KFPM is not among those. I don't know even if we're going to be added after the single sign on option is, is enabled. But to log into Gradescope, just go to gradescope.com. One of the uh, things that you can do there is uh, log in, I think, or, or sign up or something like that. Click on it, but you have to use your KPPM username and password. Okay? But this is, this is usually how I log in. I go to gradescope.com and then I uh, log in from there. And in, in Blackboard, there is a kind of a link there that will take you directly to, to great scope. But at, at least for the time being, it doesn't make sense to do it through Blackboard because you'll have to create an account uh, anyway. And you'll have to, to and, and Blackboard will remove a little bit of the screens you know, from, from the top because there's the Blackboard banner. So I, I would recommend that at least for the time being, you log in to great scope from outside Blackboard. But this is how you can log in. Uh, okay. Uh, I and we could just to add to that, uh, we are in the process of uh, having single sign on uh, for integration with Blackboard and Grid Scope. So hopefully it should be available soon. I did mention this to somebody who asked. So it is in process and we will update as soon as it gets okay. ready. Right. I have a question. Cannot, uh, uh, a question. Cannot we do uh, these tips in Grid Scope through the Blackboard? I'm not sure what uh, the gentleman as uh, Dr. Tarp, I'm not sure what, what you mean exactly. Uh, do you mean logging in? Uh, Dr. Tarp is there. Is there a way to, to make a link instead of creating a new course using the exist course in Blackboard? I'm not sure. Well, until now, this has not been enabled, so I don't know what single sign on will uh, allow. Will it, for example, be able to import the student list from uh, Blackboard directly? I assume that yes, 
But uh, until now, because this has not been enabled, I don't honestly know what are the added features that say, or the simplicity that we will get once uh, great scope is integrated with the blackboard. Uh, let's just wait for this and uh, I will be happy to, to uh, give you comment on what features integrating great scope with blackboard will add. Can we work inside blackboard by integrating great scope? Yeah, it looks like, yes, you can. Could this en enroll students? And as, as I mentioned, hopefully yes, uh, but we'll have to wait until Grayscope is, is linked with the Blackboard. Okay, thank you. So there's a hand raised. Uh, sure. Uh, if you have your ha hand raised, please just speak up. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalamu alaikum doctor. Thank you, Dr. Waji. And, uh, your team, you're you're doing a great job, and really, we are, uh, I appreciate your uh, effort. My pleasure. Uh, I have a suggestion, really, about the um, the the, uh, the activities that takes place in the, in, in, in these workshops. Okay. Uh, a workshop, as I understand it, it will be a hands-on experience where we, we the participant do something, because okay. I, I am afraid. I'm afraid that some of us may not be able to really uh, 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 understand or uh, the, the, the technical step by step that they need to do. And so if there is a possibility to, to have another workshop where there will be a, a course where we, are the uh, participants, will be the uh, uh, students. Absolutely. No you're an instructor. And then we go the, uh, the, uh, through. Uh, um, uh, uh, something. Uh, uh, I, I I got your point, Victor Mohammed, yes. and it, it would be my pleasure. I can do one next week, early next week, if you want, so that you know, to get you prepared. No problem. Uh, we'll do. Uh, we'll try to do an event, maybe next week, uh, maybe Tuesday or so, M Monday, man, probably Monday afternoon. We can spend three hours where uh, I will not uh set you as students because the students will have very few uh options let's say or things to do you're only going to be able to log in uh maybe upload uh, a scan and look at your results but i you, will you, you got my point you... i i mean we, we we have some activities we do one two three Absolutely. four and Absolutely. so on yes tell us uh, i will do one i promise you i'll do one next week thank, thank you me. very much thank you sorry for interruption Dr. Vajib. maybe i would suggest to have single sign on first uh, and blackboard set up ready then I think things will be more clear. So if we can delay well, it until, until the technical issue is resolved, I mean, if but, that's- but, uh, I'll, I'll tell you something. The, my, uh, I, maybe I have a different uh, point of view or different opinion. I think that if faculty members, if we leave this until let's say, for example, after two weeks where faculty start giving quizzes outside grade scope, let's say they don't, people would be, will, kind of be discouraged from using Grayscope because the semester has already started. I want, my hope is that uh, I provide the event as early as possible so that everybody's ready, so that with the first assignment or first, I don't know, uh, homework or first uh, quiz, which could come at the end of the first week or maybe beginning of second week or so, uh, faculty are ready so that they go and use Grayscope. I, I, honestly, I don't want to leave it till further. Yeah. I agree, I agree, because I think Blackboard only takes care of login, which is not as important as, you know, features. Yeah, of I agree. Yes. So I think it's fine. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions uh, that I missed, maybe, or? We are currently working on integrating. Of, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, can you do all these operations through great scope from inside Blackboard? Uh, I think the same, same question. Yeah. So uh, th I think I have covered more or less uh, most uh, questions. Uh, so, uh, if there's any any uh, body else has any question or so, okay. So it looks like uh, we're done. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think we are done. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Have a good day. Sorry.